For those of you who've been paying attention to the Pumpkin Saga, you'll know the name Steven Anderson. To recap, there's this organization called the New Independent Fundamentalist Baptist Movement, or the NIFB, and it's a branch off of the IFB, or Independent Fundamentalist Baptists. Independent Fundamentalist Baptists are extreme in their own right. It isn't just regular old traditional Baptist, which can also be really extreme. It's Fundamentalist Baptist, which means they take the scriptures literally. That's what the word fundamentalist means. They believe in a literal interpretation interpretation of holy text. So you've got an already extreme branch off of an already extreme religion, and a new branch forms, the NIFB, which believes in changing laws to sentence members of the LGBT community with the death penalty. They believe and scream about it very loudly that police should be arresting and executing LGBT people. In fact, many of you might have heard about this police detective from Tennessee who just got in deep trouble for advocating for the arrest and execution of members of the LGBT community from the pulp. It. What happened exactly? Who is Steven Anderson and what's his role in this whole thing? That's what we'll be talking about today. Let's get into it. Before we get into it, I just want to mention that you can support me short term through a GoFundMe that I set up to help offset the demonetization and view drop I experienced last month. I have seen an amazing swell of support from people. I am seriously humbled by what you guys have done to help me. I can't express my appreciation enough. If you want to support me there, you can click the card in the corner or the link in the description. Also check out my Patreon, it's the best long term way to support me. I want to get to the point where I don't have to rely on YouTube as my source of income because as it stands, I obviously have to worry about being demonetized. And finally, I wanted to mention that I'm having a meetup for a few hours on Sunday, June 30th. There's a link to that in the description too. It's in Lincoln, Nebraska. We'll just be hanging out and grilling and stuff, so if you want to meet me and talk for a few hours, take a look at that. If you can't make this one, I'll be doing other meetups in other locations around the country, so don't stress too much. There will be other opportunities. Now on to the NIFB. I've talked about the NIFB a couple times already on my channel, but it's kind of an unfolding situation, so let me just catch you guys up in case you haven't seen my other videos on it. As I mentioned, the NIFB is a branch off of an already extreme branch off of an already extreme denomination. It's run by Steven Anderson, and they have some very choice beliefs about the LGBT community. They're very politically and religiously conservative by nature, which, in America, usually means that they're for smaller government. But that's only true when it comes to paying people salaries, like police officers, for example. But that desire for small government all goes away when it comes to getting the government to do something they want, like having those people whose salaries salaries you don't want to pay, execute members of the LGBT community, or forcing people to have children that they aren't prepared to have physically, mentally, or emotionally. It's hypocrisy to the deepest extent. They're inconsistent in their views and beliefs, and they don't care. It honestly pisses me off, but now I'm just getting off on a tangent. Getting back to it. For the past few weeks, me, Mr. Atheist, Godless Engineer, Shannon Q, Atheist Rationale, and a bunch of other YouTubers have been working on exposing the NIFB for what it is, a hate group. Now, historically, I've never believed in deplatforming. I feel like we should let them say it so we have a record of it, so we can talk about it. Like with Jehovah's Witnesses, I want to let them say what's in their hearts so we can address it. Deplatforming reinforces their persecution complex and it drives them underground. They can't say what they want to say in public, so they learn to only say it around people who are accepting. And since they only talk to people who are open to their ideas, they get more and more radicalized over time. Their ideas get more and more extreme. They all grow in a dangerous direction together. Shining a light on what they're doing makes it so that they receive pushback. It decreases the level of extremism and keeps it in check. So as I said, I don't believe in deplatforming. I never have. However, I do have a personal line for that. The NIFB is advocating for the execution of innocent people, morally speaking. They use very violent rhetoric. When you advocate for violence, that's my line. That's when I feel it's okay to deplatform. Let anybody say whatever they want, because it'll show us what you're all about and we can address the ideas out in the open. As Noam Chomsky famously said, freedom of expression doesn't exist so people can talk about apple pie. The purpose of it is to protect the worst, most disgusting, vile speech. If you didn't believe in freedom of expression for people with whom you disagree, then you don't believe in it at all. That's been my Twitter description for years and I stand by it, but I can't accept people endorsing execution of innocent people. Now, there's one more thing I want to mention before we continue. That's been my philosophy through all of this, but when we started reporting 
the videos that specifically advocate for violence, YouTube started taking those videos down. It was working. That's what we wanted. Leave up the bad stuff, but take down the violent stuff. But as time went on, I started to see the immediate effects. People didn't have access to those videos anymore. They weren't a part of the discourse. I couldn't point people to their video and say, see what they're saying? This is why I go so hard against this group. I had an archive of all of their worst stuff that I could review myself, but the archive wasn't public. It didn't have the kind of reach that Steven Anderson, the leader of the NIFB, had with 120,000 subscribers. That made me rethink my position on deplatforming. Even in cases of advocacy for violent action, should we leave this stuff up so we have a record of it? I still stand by the fact that advocacy for violence doesn't belong in public discourse. I'm still glad the videos came down in the end. But I can see the other side. I understand where people are coming from when they say we should allow everything. There is an argument there. So if you feel like we should never do it under any circumstances, then I get where you're coming from. I'm just not there with it. Anyways, I feel like I needed to get that off my chest before we go on. Now regarding that pastor who said all that in Tennessee, he got national coverage. His name is Grayson Fritz. He was up at the pulpit talking about the same stuff as Steven Anderson. We should arrest and execute members of the LGBT community. All that stuff. But the scary bit about this is that it wasn't just a normal pastor. That's bad enough. Steven Anderson is just a pastor, or self-proclaimed pastor at least. But this guy from Tennessee, Grayson Fritz, he's also a police detective. That made the situation that much more disgusting. He is actively calling for police to arrest and execute an innocent segment of the population, even if that innocence is in a legal context only. And he's actually out there working for the police department. It's disturbing. How many cases have his views colored? Has he ever shot anybody in the line of duty? Was it justified? How do you know it was justified? As many police point out, they write the reports. Luckily, the Freedom From Religion Foundation picked up on that one specific case and called for an investigation into the guy. Since the investigation started, they discovered a few interesting things in his past. Here's a quote from KnoxNews.com. In November 2009, Fritz was off duty and working private security when he fired twice at a man trying to flee in a car from a Kroger parking lot in Farragut after shoplifting, according to a sheriff's office report and Knox News Sentinel archives. Fritz missed both times from close range, and the driver sped away, but was later arrested. First of all, you don't shoot at somebody who's running from you. I thought that was common knowledge. If it isn't common knowledge, then it should, at the very least, be taught in police academies. And if it is taught in police academy, then why are there so many reports of cops doing it anyways? So, anyways, that's not great. Firing on somebody who's trying to run away. Over a shoplifting offense. Give me a break! The website also says, he's been employed by Knox County government since 1999 and worked in maintenance until 2000 when he began working in corrections. He became a patrol officer in 2003 and a detective in 2014. Fritz gave the LGBT sermon on June 2nd, which is right around the time Mr. Atheist, Shannon Q, Godless Engineer, Casey, I, and others started going hard against the NIFB. Then on June 12th, Knox News from Knox County, Tennessee, where all this went down, reported on the sermon. From there, it was really interesting to see how people responded to the fallout. The Knox County Mayor denounced what he said, and the Knox County Sheriff claimed that his fear of the First Amendment lawsuits was preventing him from firing him. And that's where it gets interesting. Remember, he gave the famous sermon on June 2nd, and the news first started talking about it on June 12th, 10 days later. But on May 15th, almost a month before it blew up, he'd already filled out the paperwork to be included in a buyout offer, which was offered to all county employees. So he was already on his way out the door before any of this went down. In fact, that might be why he said the sermon in the first place. This this didn't affect his career prospects in any way. The buyout was set to take effect on July 19th, and he's been using up the last of his sick days to stay off the job until then. Now, at least one positive did come from this. Supposedly, according to the sheriff and others, they started investigating any cases he's worked on to see if there was any foul play or something. Unfortunately, it doesn't really matter at this point. As I said before, he wrote the reports. At least he won't be working there anymore. Even though there basically aren't any negative consequences for him because he already requested requested the buyout long before this happened, I can count it as a win, if for no other reason than that. At least he isn't walking the streets with a gun and a badge anymore. It's better than nothing. But since he's cut from the same cloth as Steven Anderson, I figured we'd take a gander at Steven Anderson's family blog. Let's see what they have going on in their lives. As a disclaimer, I want to point out that I do not, under any circumstances, endorse harassment of any kind, ever. And I'm not just saying that for legal protection. I would be very upset if somebody harassed Steven Anderson or any other member of the NIFB. It isn't helpful. It makes him even more sure that they're right because God said this would happen. So don't harass anybody. Now, with that being said, let's take a look at this thing. Let's get into it. 
Oh shit, I already said that. Never mind. Let's just look at the blog. Something to make note of regarding Steven Anderson and lots of people in the NIFB is that a lot of them are part of something called the Quiverful Movement. I've talked about the Quiverful Movement before. People in the Quiverful Movement believe that you shouldn't use birth control at all. Just have kids until you can't have kids anymore. It's based off of and named after a Bible verse, Psalm 127, 3 to 5. It says, Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. Well, that's weird. What's that bit about court at the end? Anyways, if you notice, the verses are structured like lyrics to a song, even though they don't rhyme or anything. The reason for that is because Psalms is basically comprised of Jewish hymnals. It was their songbooks, the songs they sang at church, which says all kinds of strange things about their culture once you take a closer look at some of what the verses say. Anyways, that's where the term quiverful comes from. It says children are like arrows in the hands of a warrior, and you're blessed for having a quiver full of them. So Steven Anderson believes in having children until the mother's body just gives out. The Duggars are also part of the quiverful movement, and some other famous religious people. I think Steven Anderson is up to like 10 kids, and they've been married for 18 years, since he was 19 years old. So she's been having about one kid every 21 months or so for 18 years. Imagine that. That is like so bad for the human body, to have that many. How do you even transport that many kids? You'd have to have some kind of giant church vans to transport a total of 12 people. So if they don't use birth control, how is it that they have kids every 21 months or so instead of every 9 to 12 months? According to Steven Anderson, his wife nurses the babies. And this is partially true, as long as you're nursing, you won't get pregnant. I say partially true because it isn't 100% for sure thing. You can still get pregnant. It's just your chances of getting pregnant are lower if you're breastfeeding. So that's how they extend it. She continues to nurse her kids for as long as she can. When she stops nursing them, after about 10 months or so, she gets pregnant again. It basically damns her to a life of servitude to Steven. How do you even leave somebody if you have 10 kids with them? What if he became abusive or something? She doesn't have a job. Her job is a full-time mother. She has no choice but to stay with him. How do you fit all the kids into a house? You'd have to have a bare minimum of a six-bedroom house for 10 kids and you. One bedroom for you, five bedrooms to split between the 10 kids. There are laws about how old they are, their gender, and some other factors which determine how many and which ones can share a room. So six is the absolute minimum number of bedrooms. Six bedroom houses are expensive, not to mention the cost of food every month. It must be absurd. She's financially and physically incapable of leaving the dude. And that's one of the main issues I have with the Quiverful movement. But that's just the first thing that sticks out when I look at his family blog, all the kids. There's a lot to cover on this blog, but some of the other things that stick out to me are the sections entitled Medicine Cabinet and School Room. They homeschool their children, mostly because they can indoctrinate them into extreme easier that way. But also because Steven Anderson is a complete conspiracy theorist and believes that the U.S. education system is trying to indoctrinate kids into evolutionism and all kinds of other really disturbing conspiracy theories about World War II and medical treatment and all kinds of others. Which brings me to my next point, the section entitled Medicine Cabinet. Let's take a look-see at what they think about modern medicine. Bear in mind, some of these blog posts are written by his wife, some by his kids, and I think there are even a couple by him. But the majority of the content content is written by his wife, and she mirrors his views on some things perfectly. The first article under Medicine Cabinet is entitled, Mom Tip ear infections. Now, we know how to cure ear infections. The doctor can prescribe some medicine that'll clear it right up. But Stephen's wife believes in something called garlic mullein oil. It's homeopathic, obviously. Interestingly enough, my mom was actually into homeopathic medicine, too. I wonder what it is about having lots of kids that pushes people toward homeopathy, which, by the way, is complete bunk. Anyways, there were four of us kids when I was growing up, and I was number four. She took me to a homeopathic, quote-unquote, doctor for most of my childhood. Luckily, she didn't go completely off the deep end. If I needed real medicine, then I got it. Most of the time. But she definitely did give me homeopathic remedies pretty often. Scrolling down on the medicine cabinet section, I see a blog article entitled, A World Without Cancer. It says, My husband and I have been eating three apricot kernels with each meal. They are bitter, but definitely palatable, especially when eaten with a few raisins or half of a dried apricot. Uh-oh. These people believe that eating apricot seeds will cure cancer. For reference, apricot seeds contain something called amygdalin, which is poisonous. You should not be eating apricot seeds. They do not cure cancer. They don't prevent cancer either.
Twitter. It's complete bullshit. The article goes on to say, each serving of three kernels provides 30 milligrams of vitamin B17 for a total of 90 milligrams per day. While there is no recommended daily allowance for B17, it has been suggested that a dose of 100 milligrams per day for adults is an effective cancer preventative. No, that's not true. The reason there's no recommended daily allowance for amygdalin is because it's poison. Do not take it. It has no value as a cancer preventative. The blog says, I read a recommendation by one nurse who said that children could eat a number of kernels per day equal to their age, up to a maximum of seven per day. Please do not give this stuff to children. Please get real treatment if you need it. There is no evidence whatsoever that this stuff prevents cancer. Seriously, this is so scary. And it's just another conspiracy theory. This blog actually gets a lot of traffic. There are a lot of people reading it. These are genuinely harmful people with harmful ideas and violent rhetoric. I hope people realize how toxic this group of people really is. Anyways, that's all I've got for you. If you like what I do and you want to make sure I can continue to do it, then check me out on Patreon. Or you can check me out on Teespring. YouTube is up and down. It's completely unreliable. I'd like to get to the point where I don't have to rely on YouTube to make sure I can pay rent every month. I couldn't survive as long as I have without Patreon. So I want to say thank you to everybody who supports me through that. Also, I just added two new tiers for supporters. Now you can donate $50 per creation or $100 per creation. I'm doing a weekly hangout with my top supporters where we get on a phone call and chat for a bit. Also check out my podcast. I talk about the latest religious and political news. All links are in the description as always. Okay, thanks for watching guys.